Good morning, Southgate. Uh, if we haven't met yet, my name is Brett and I am the intern here. And if you're joining us for the first time or, or just want to uh, get more information, feel free to comment below. We'd love to get in touch with you uh, during our online service today. Uh, just a few announcements though before we get too far. Uh, I do want to let you know that we are going to have a good Friday service for Easter this year. So that's April 15th in person at 10 a.m. Uh, we're gonna have a Good Friday service in Kempville, okay? So I'd love to invite you to, to that. Also, we will not have an online service for Easter, okay? So we're just having in-person services. So in Winchester on Easter, April 17th, we'll have our regular service at 10 a.m. But in Kempville, we're gonna have two services, one at 9 a.m. and one at 10.30. And so there's no registration required for Easter, but I do just wanna let you know that there won't be an online service, but we'd love to have you, if you're comfortable, join us in person. Uh, again, we have the two service options uh, in Kempville and then our regular time in Winchester. And um, if you just need reminders um, on anything like that, we'll, um, we'll have more information online on our socials, so feel free to follow us um, on Instagram or Facebook. Um, before we jump in to worship, let me pray for you. God, I just pray that um, you meet us where we're at, God, that you stir us um, to hope, that you remind us as we just anticipate just um, Easter coming up soon, God. I pray that you uh, remind us of the hope we have and how your spirit moves and gives us new life, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.
So every now and then, I mean, we haven't played this game in a while, but every now and then we play this game in our house uh, with our family, and it's, uh, it's called Mr. Ooze. Mr. Ooze, I, I don't know why we call it that, to be honest. It's just called Mr. Ooze. And here's how the game goes. I go somewhere in the house... And mind you, I'm very good at it. I go somewhere in the house and I hide. But I don't, I just not only hide, I take a blanket and I put it over my head and, and wherever I'm hiding, I'm under this blanket. Now, it normally, I mean, normally I'm hiding just, just forever because I, I find real good hiding spots. And then once one of my children or my wife, if they find me, then Mr. Ooze, it's like a trap that I've set for them. And Mr. Ooze comes out, I open up the blanket like this, and I chase them until I can put the blanket over them, and then they are part of the ooze, all right? They're part of the ooze, then we go catch everybody until everyone is under the blanket. That's, I don't know, it's a messed up game, that's just what we play, trying to trap my kids into Mr. Ooze. And, And today is all about traps. Now, if you remember in Daniel chapter 5, we talked about Belshazzar. He's throwing this huge party, right? And we found out about the the thing, kind of writing, the handwriting on the wall and and what the handwriting is for us. What is God writing on the wall for us? And we found out that the Persians were camped outside the city gates, ready to attack. The army was ready to pounce on Babylon. And, uh, but Belshazzar didn't care. He's throwing a party because he believed that everything was going to be okay because they had 20 years of food reserves. They had the Euphrates River flowing underneath the walls of the city so they could have fresh water. I mean, there's nothing to worry about until we get uh, to the end of that chapter and we find out exactly what takes place. Now, the Persian army, they're no dummies. The the Persian armies, they knew exactly what they were doing. They weren't just going to give up. And so here's what they did. They underwent a massive project And they started to dig a canal. And they dug a canal, and the canal took the water from the Euphrates River, diverted it to a lake until it dried up. And here's what the Persian army did. They just just walked on the river floor underneath the wall right into the city. And they captured the city almost with, with, with no kind of aggression at all. It was just, just kind of given to them. And so not only does Babylon fall, it falls just like an absolute embarrassing way because it just wasn't any fight at all. It just falls. And the Persians take over and the Medes take over. And uh, the opening verses in Daniel chapter 6, it tells us that there's a, there's a new administration in town. This seems like the theme of Daniel is just new administration, new administration. Just kind of comes, goes all, all the time. But one thing kind of remains the same throughout the whole story. Now, Darius the Mede takes on the kingdom and somehow, some way, this guy is the new king. He's the new antagonist in our story, while Daniel is still the protagonist in our story. He's still the good guy. He's still listening to God. He's still trying to follow through with integrity in his life as he lives as an exile in Babylon. And we pick up the story here in Daniel chapter 6, 1 to 3. And this is the first section. I've been breaking these things down into sections. The first section is called, It's a Trap. It's a trap. It's a trap. All right. And here's what it says. Daniel 6, 1 to 3, it reads like this. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Now, a satrap is, uh, is, is someone who is uh, a governor, if you will, over the Persian Empire. And so kind of like if you think about like a premier for us in Canada, right? He governs over a territory and Daniel is one of three people in charge of 120 of these satraps. And we're just going to call those positions presidents, if you will, all right? So Daniel's kind of like a president over, one of three, over 120 of these satraps, which would kind of be like a premier to us, all right? So we're on the same page. And as we've seen in the past, I mean, people just love Daniel. 
that the king, he identifies Daniel as a fully capable guy, that he understands that he is totally going to be honest and transparent and tell the truth. He's seen it. He's heard the stories. And so Daniel stands out to him. And he, he, he decides, you know what, I'm, I, I want to I give him more responsibility. I want to make him ruler, not just with these three individuals, these three presidents over the 120. I want to make him second only to the king. I, I want him to rule over the kingdom so that I really don't have to do anything. Now, when the, when, when the, when, when the other two presidents, when they hear this, they're not happy. I mean, uh, they get jealous. It's kind of like when someone gets a promotion and you thought you were going to get it. They're, they're frustrated. They're angry. They don't know what to do. They get jealous. And, and what they try to do is they try to dig up dirt on him. What can we find about this guy? Let, let, let's, look at the, let's look at what he's done in the past. Let, let's hire a private investigator. Let's figure out what he's done and, and try to ruin him. But the thing is, listen, when you live an upright life, it's freeing. Well, when you live an upright life, it's freeing. Yes, you might have made decisions that were totally permissible, but they are not beneficial. Yes, you have made sacrifices along the way that you saw other people. Yeah, it's okay for the world to do, but, but you decided, you know, I'm going to follow the straight and narrow. And because of that, it is freeing because when the satraps try to find dirt on you, when those other two presidents try to find stuff on you, you know what their answer is? You know, you know what they find? Nothing. Because you have nothing to hide. You, you live a transparent life. Everyone knows who you are. Your, your character stands out. Your favor is among people. They, they know you. They, they, they understand how you've lived up to this point. So there's nothing to hide. And these guys, they can't find anything on Daniel. That's, that's what they find. Absolutely nothing. And so when they find nothing, they develop a plot. Well, well, that didn't work. So now we got to figure out some other way to take this guy down because, because he can't be the one in charge of us. And this is key for us. We need to seek integrity in an enticing world. There are a lot of things that sound good and look good. And yet we need to seek integrity even in the midst of those things. As we stated from the very beginning, God's desire is not for us to turn our churches into gatherings and hideouts from the world. We are not supposed to, to, to kind of be stuck in this Christian bubble in the midst of this Babylon that's all around us and not interact with everyone and make sure that everyone is just good influences on our kid and on our family and we only connect them with certain people and individuals. That's not, that's not what God calls us to do. We are meant to be places where we become equipped, where we become fortified to minister outside of the walls, to go out into the world, and to be light in a dark place. Which leads us to the second section here. The satraps lay a trap. The satraps lay a trap. And it's found in Daniel 6, 6 to 9. It reads like this. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree, put it into writing that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, the, the, this kingdom, the, the Persian Empire, this was kind of unique to them. And so they, the, when they made a law, you could never reverse the law. Now, we think that that might be crazy to think about, but there were some benefits to that. When you have a law that you can't, that you can't uh, 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 take away, it really makes you, you're supposed to think about what you're doing. You're supposed to really dot your I's, cross your T's. You're supposed to really seek wisdom and clarity and understanding before you would enact a law because you knew that you couldn't go back. You couldn't reverse it. And this is the situation here. They cannot reverse this law. This is part of the culture. This is part of the empire. And they have to follow through. And so the satraps, they go to Darius. They start to kiss up to him. 
and, uh, and build him up. And they convince him to sign a document ordering everyone to pray to him, to worship him and only him for 30 days. Or else they'll be thrown into a den of lions. Which leads us to the next section. How many traps would a satrap trap if a satrap could trap traps? You want to try that? Huh? Want to try that? And so here's what's taking place. We find Daniel, he pays no attention to this. He doesn't care about this 30-day decree. He's going to live with integrity. He has nothing to hide. He wants to live on the straight and narrow. He wants to represent God in all that he does. And so he continues to pray. He continues to pray to God at his window. He faces Jerusalem as he prays. The satraps go to Darius and they've been spying on Daniel and they tell, they tell Darius, this is what Daniel, the, the guy who you want to put in charge of everything, this is what he's doing. And the king really likes Daniel and, and makes every effort to save him. But still, the satraps remind him, you can't change the law. You made this, you signed it. You can't change in Daniel chapter 6, 16, it says this. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. <clears throat> and so he throws Daniel in the lion's den. But before it happens, Darius tells Daniel that he hopes, he hopes that Daniel's God is real. He hopes that Daniel's God will rescue him. And after Daniel's put inside, the den is sealed over with a giant boulder. See, one writer remarked that Daniel's bedroom was the real lion's den. Faced with the unthinkable, praying the night before, leading up to that moment, giving it over to God, dealing with the spiritual battle that was taking place. He won there. And if he did, the real lines were no problem. See, we think the miracle was that Daniel survived a night with the lions, and that's a miracle for sure. But another miracle here is that he continued to pray, even when his life was on the line. He continued to act. He continued to press forward. He continued to give it to God and to trust God in the depths of despair. And so the question becomes, what do you do when they call for the lions? What's your response? When it's all on the line, when you find yourself in the pit, when you're in a desperate situation, you don't know how to get out of it, seems like there's no way out of it, and you know it is life-altering. It could change the course of your life, the future, that you understand now. What do you do? For me, it's, it, 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 it's hard, right? You almost feel paralyzed. Man, I can't control this. I, I can't, I, I want to get out of this. I want to think my way. I need to figure this out. I need, I need to do more stuff. I need to, need to make the, sure this happens or we go this direction. But you just, you can't. And, and here's what Daniel does. He doesn't change a thing. He doesn't change a thing. He kept on serving God. He kept on doing right. He kept on living for Jesus. And he let the chips fall wherever they fell. Because there was nothing that he could do except to trust God. And so Daniel's thrown into the lion's den. It's a, it's a, it's a pit, if you can imagine, dug into the ground. And there's, there's a kind of hole in the top. You're lowered, lowered inside. It is sealed with a rock. It's pitch black in there. There's no lights. The boulder is placed over. There's no escape. It's crude. It's very, it's very, very effective form of capital punishment in the day. No one ever got out alive, especially not Daniel. The guy's 80 years old at this point. I mean, he's as good as dead the moment they threw him in, or so they thought. Notice here, Daniel's three did nots. 
First one is this. He did not try to escape the consequences of his decision to obey God. He completely followed through. Number two, he did not know what would happen. It was unknown. He didn't know what the next day, he didn't know what the next minute, the next second. He had no idea what the future held. And number three, he did not make a deal with God to save himself. You ever done, you ever done one of those? Try to make a deal with God? I, I'm, in, I'm in a situation like this. God, God, if you just help me out in this situation, then, then I promise I'll read my Bible twice a day, every day for whatever. Like, I promise I will do this for you. You kind of make, try to make this deal. He doesn't do that. He doesn't make a deal with God. Ultimately, Daniel was not afraid to die. He might have suspected that God was going to rescue him, but he didn't know. He didn't know what was going to happen as he sat there in this pit, as he's lowered down, as, as he slides down and lays on his backside, as it's pitch black and the next few seconds, he hears the steps of the lions. He hears them breathing and maybe the growl in their voice. Maybe he feels their breath on him. And he sits there, he's, he's got to be terrified. He doesn't know what future holds. And as seconds turn to minutes, and minutes turn to hours, he realizes, God's got this. The fear of the unknown, the, the, the fear of the things that we can't control, the, the fear of the situations that we find ourselves in, sometimes those are traps. They paralyze us. They, they keep us from being effective. A lot of people struggle with, with this in, in understanding death. I do, I do a lot of funerals. I've walked alongside many families who have lost loved ones. There, there's got to be a time when you've thought about, hey, what, how long do I have here? What, what is the writing? How long are my days numbered here? How, how much time do I have I did find this messed up thing last night, <laughs> and uh, it'll kind of glimpse into my, my weird brain here, but uh, there's actually a thing called deathclock.com, and uh, I would not say it's the most trustworthy thing you could put your trust in, but here's what it is. You, you, type, in, you type in your age, you type in your sex, and, and you put in a few information, and then it kicks out a date that you are going to die. That you are going to die. And, uh, and so my personal, I'm owning it, my personal day of death is this. Thursday, June 18th, 2054. All right? My wife, you see that? 2054. June 18th, 2054. That, that is what is kicking out my day of death. And uh, that means, you know, I have 1,016,039,815 uh, seconds to live. That was last night. So time's uh, ticking here, and it's even less now. But it's, it's a crazy thing when you think about, it. you know, I can't control when my life ends. And there are so many things that we can't control that we want to control. This is not my day. Maybe it is. I, I mean, this is not my day of death. I have no idea when that's going to be. And neither does Daniel. Now, after heading home, Darius the king, he refuses to eat. He feels sick. He's unable to sleep. You know that feeling? Staying up all night, dwelling on something that you can't control. In those moments, God's got it. Which leads us to the next section here. It's called the satraps. Trapped by their own trap. All right, And we pick up the story here in Daniel 6, 24. It reads like this. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in, thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all of their bones. It's interesting. I read my kids' Bible stories at night and, uh, and looking at their little cartoon Bibles. And you know what? This is not really usually included so much, the wives and the kids thing. And, and the whole family situation thrown in as the lions crush their bones. Like, it's, that's not part of the story usually considered in the Bible I read to my kids. But the next day, Daniel heads down to the den to see if God saved Daniel. And he has. And, and Daniel's fine. And, and answers the king when Darius calls out to him. Daniel explains, God's angel showed up and made sure the lion's mouths were shut 
And so Daniel saved, Darius allows him out of the den, and Darius decides, you know what? These people, they did lay a trap, and now I'm going to punish them. And, and we saw, not only were those guys thrown into the lion's den, but their family was, their wives and their children. Now, why would I put emphasis on that? Here's why. is because when you hold secrets, when, you, when, when there's things that you have to hide, it does not only affect you. It affects those around you. They pay the price for your poor decision. It affects them all. And in this situation, those kids, those wives, they didn't deserve to die. They didn't deserve to be in that situation. And yet, because of the poor decision, the trap that they set apart, I mean, they're, they're forced into this as well. And so, like Nebuchadnezzar before him, Darius issues a proclamation telling everyone that they need to respect and fear Daniel's God. He pays tribute to God for saving Daniel and says that God's kingdom will outlast all others. And the chapter ends stating that Daniel went on, things went pretty well for him, both during Darius' reigns and the next king, Cyrus. And so let, let, let's take a look. I, I just got some lessons for modern day Daniels like us. When we find ourselves in the position where the lions are ready to pounce. Number one, it is possible to live a pure life in the midst of a thoroughly pagan world. That is possible. You can do it. God calls you to do it. He believes you can do it. And with his strength, you can. Number two, Christians who live for God should expect opposition because when you live this way, when you are effective for the kingdom, you face opposition. You face opposition in Babylon, in the world. And if you don't face opposition, you need to, you need to observe your life. You, you need to ask yourself, what am I actually doing? If nothing is hard for you, then are you actually living this thing out? Number three, God can use us to, to touch unlikely people when we're faithful to him. This, the situations, you don't know if you are leaning up or down or to the sides. You don't know who's watching. You don't know what's taking place. You don't know what people know about your secrets or not. You got to live openly in everything that you do because people notice that. And the people you never thought you would reach, suddenly God brings them into view. Number four. God is able to deliver his people from any danger they face. We, we don't know what the end result will be, but we have to believe that God will deliver his people, his kids. And number five, God always delivers in his own time and in his own way. And there's a reason that God is God and you are not. He knows better. He knows more. He knows all things. And so he does it in his own time. He delivers but we don't know what that looks like. It might not look like how we want it to look, but he always does. And so I just have one next step. One simple next step here for today. And this is it. Very simple. Trust God. Trust God as you are an exile in Babylon. Trust God in the midst of your temptation. Cling to him as the lions pounce and, and, they're, and they're chasing you or they're trying to look at ways to devour you or the traps are out in the world. Trust God in the midst of those things. Trust God with the unknown of tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. Trust God when you're thinking about how long do I have on this earth? Trust God in the things that you can't control. Hold on to him no matter what and he will deliver you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a father that we can trust. You are faithful, and you have nothing to hide because you are perfect. You are true through and through. There is no secrets. There's, there, there, there's nothing like that. And Father, I thank you that you know every detail about who we really are. The secrets that we hold, the decisions that we've made in our past, the, the baggage that we carry, God, you know it all. There is no place that we can hide like Mr. Ooze. You, you have it all. And so, Father, may, may we just live openly before you. God, would you give us the strength 
to resist the traps that the enemy gives us, God? This enticing world that we live in, Father, that you would, you would give us strength and courage to walk the straight and narrow, to live like Daniel did in the midst of the unknown. Father, carry us, lead us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.